Okay, so I'm Marcus. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how you can build your own robots and control them by using Java. And uh, I'm going to be very pragmatic about this. So I think after this talk, you should all be able to just, you know, pretty much go home and build something. So that's my goal with this talk, is to, to, to give you the information you need to just go home and build a robot. Okay. Okay, so we're, we're going, to, going to start from the absolute beginning. Do I still need to? Okay. So the thing is, first you need to find a computer that you can destroy without like breaking you or ruin you. So, 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 um, and over the last few years, it's been sort of a revolution there. You can buy Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi has several cores. Um, it has uh, enough computing power for you to actually do, do some interesting calculations while your robot is running. So uh, I've destroyed uh, just one so far, which is interesting. I uh, should have probably destroyed more, but, but it's just, count is still just at one. But you have to, to realize that you might actually destroy your computer when you're doing this thi these things. Uh, so, so, you know, get yourself something cheap. And the Raspberry Pi is pretty much as cheap as they go. There is even a Raspberry Pi Zero. Just has one core, so depending on what you want to do with your robot, it might be a very good fit, but, but it's even cheaper. So, um, the Raspberry Pi Zero is also clocked slightly lower, I think. Anyways, so first, you get yourself a Raspberry Pi. Or, or something that you can control your robot with. Um, then you need to know a little bit about um, uh, RC hardware. Uh, so we're going to do a quick brief detour to, to RC, uh, so radio controlled hardware, because um, their radio controlled servos, etc., are, are really cheap. And how you design your hardware is going to be very affected about, uh, you know, some crucial details around this. Okay, so um, RC hardware or radio-controlled server servos are, are controlled by something called a PWM signal, so pulse width modulation. So they, they, they look something like this. Oh, guys. Um, uh, no? Oh, oh, okay, good. Okay, 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 okay. So let's 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 try to pull, pulse width modulation signal here. So we have something like this. Boom, doom, 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 doom. Doom, 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 doom. And here you have something like 20 milliseconds. And here you typically have 1.5 milliseconds. So the controlling the hardware is decided by the width of these pulses, right? And the pulse width to have the, the servo in neutral is typically 1.5 milliseconds, right? So there is a point to this, I promise. <laughs> okay, so um, have these signals going, and to make the servo do a full write, say, just the difference is that you have it up for two milliseconds. So talking about Java then, if you're trying to output a pulse width modulation signal from <laughs> a GPIO, let's say, uh, pin, what happens if we have a GC that starts right about here? Or, well, more interestingly, maybe, but still get into undefined territory. What happens when you get one here? Well, still gonna output that signal so if you have a one millisecond GC, you're screwed. It's undefined territory. You go from center to, I don't know, a harder right. Uh, so, so it's not a very good fit. So what do you do when you build hardware that you want to run with Java then? Well, uh, there are um, chips. So the MEMS technology is, is so far along now that, that you can actually buy, buy um, uh, chips that do pretty much anything very inexpensively. So you have chips that are so-called IMUs, for example, 
inertial measurement units, um, which contains accelerometer, gyros, magnetic compass, everything on the same chip. Um, and, and of course, there is a chip for, <laughs> for doing um, PWM signals that has its own built-in clock. Okay, so, so that's what you do to be able to, to, to control servos. Um, right. Other details is um, there are several ways that you might want to wire up these, this hardware together with, with uh, your, your, your Raspberry Pi. There are multiple different protocols. Some manufacturers have their own. Uh, there are several different, for example, one-wire protocols. Um, so so um, when you're controlling uh, your hardware, you need to select hardware that, if, at least if you're a beginner, that is easy to, to work with. And um, there is something called I2C, <coughs> uh, which is basically an interchip protocol. Um, you address chips individually, and um, <coughs> you can have several of them connected to the same, same ports, same signals. So, so that's what I would suggest, at least when you're a beginner, to always look for, for, for chips that can be run over I2C because it makes it much easier for you to wire up things without getting things wrong. And once you've wired one up, it's easy to add more. So, so you so, sort of solve the problem once and then you can just keep adding stuff. And don't be afraid of, of, of reading the specifications for these chips, uh, you know, looking at the protocols, because, I mean, programming with robots, um, at least at the lowest level, is always just reading and writing registers. That's all you do. You address some little chip somewhere, you write things to make things happen, you read data from them, uh, from, from different registers. And it's not scary at all. I mean, it's just a big table of specifications of addresses that you need to look into. So, 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 so hardware is, is really not that scary. Um, so just, you know, buy the chips that you need if there isn't any, any abstraction over them. And that's one of the cool things about uh, Robo4j. There are several layers uh, in Robo4j. So let's uh, talk about those briefly. So um, you have um, well, one module called Robo4J dash uh, RPI dash hardware. Okay, so if you don't want to use anything of Robo4J, but you don't want to look into the specification, find out all the things the thing can do, write, you know, experiment and see what it actually, you know. There are some, some hardware vendors that do funny things like having everything being, you know, I will want to read the gyro from the X, Y, Z axis. So it's address X. You know, then plus one is Y, and then plus two is Z. But then for some reason, the gyro is X, Z, Y. And then you go tear your head and don't understand why things don't work. If you don't want to do that, Robo4j has a lot of these um, abstractions for you, right? So, so you can just go ahead and, and use them. And we've taken the pain to <laughs> actually get them work. And then you don't use anything else but the hardware abstractions. So you don't buy into this whole framework thing. So that's one way you can be using Robo4j for, for quickly getting up to speed. And the hardware that we're using is off the shelf, easily and readily available hardware that you can just buy in a hobby store or, or at Adafruit or, or a Spark Fun or wherever. And if you don't find your favorite component there or any support for it, you write support for it, and then you contribute it to Robo4j. Awesome. <clears throat> so that's one way to, 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 to use Robo4j. But then there is um, the, the Robo4j core API, uh, which extends upon the model and gives you a messaging framework. And, and 
even easier to use abstractions. So um, it basically is just an XML file where you specify <coughs> and configure your hardware components and then you have messages that you can send to them. Um, so, so, so it's uh, one layer above the core, I don't know, device driver or whatever you want to call it. Right. And if you use those, um, getting something up and running, so if you, for example, have a, let's say, for example, a, a Raspberry Pi with an LCD shield and you just want to, like, write fancy messages in different colors or whatever, um, then that, those are just literally little XML file that specifies that, hey, I have this thing and this is the address that I've wired it to. And then when you start, you can just send messages to that, um, that thing and, and, and uh, hey, presto, you have something in hardware where you're actually getting colorful full messages. Um, Okay, so Robo4j has this, um, when you have these different agents running, you might want to control how the messages are handled, right? So you might want to make sure, for example, that they are handled uh, just one message at a time in a synchronized fashion, or you might want to make sure that they go on a certain thread pool because they might need a lot of computational power, or, or they might be blocking, and all that is handled through annotations. So, so. Um, when you have your own little little agent um, that that you want to write, you you just set an annotation for for that agent, which which then uses a certain uh, thread pool to schedule the messaging or the handling of the messaging the messages. Um, yeah. Oh, so yeah. So you don't really need to care, uh, but if you want to, if you are writing your own device driver, say, um, it's all over general purpose I.O. Um, uh, well, it's not all GPIO. There are some serial ports, etc. but it's all through Pi4J. Um, so there is a hardware abstraction uh, for C called wiring Pi, and then there is a Java wrapper for that called, called Pi4J. And all it does is give you access to the writing and reading of addresses, for example, for 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 um, for um, I to C or I to C or use SPI, which is another another one of those protocols, uh, or serial or you know whichever protocol you now need, right? So there's a bunch of them. And uh, of course, when you're building hardware, if you are building if you just have like the standard protocols, then it's usually really easy because what you end up doing is just having this um, having this um, switchboard, if you will, right? So you just keep wiring things together. You don't really need to do. It's not like unless you do switch buttons and some other things, you typically don't need to deal with resistors or capacitors. And even for the places where you might need capacitors to, 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 to reduce some noise, for example, with uh, motor controllers or, or um, the servo controllers, things like that, uh, the, the, the little breakout board that you typically start with uh, actually has a place that's like here put the capacitor here if you're trying to drive more than x servos it's like it's hard to fail nowadays it's really really easy um so don't be afraid of just starting having fun with this um it's not that easy to kill your yeah, i i did <laughs> but it, it's actually not that easy uh, to start killing your hardware uh, and Uh, so depending on, and that's what I'm, why I'm saying this, uh, you know, there, there are so many different variants of these, these breakout boards, so when you start, try to find uh, breakout boards that where, where there is support for I2C, because that's the easiest way to not go wrong. And if you need to go with, with other technologies, like uh, if there are proprietary, let's say, one-wire protocols, then things start getting interesting because then you need to do PWM and you can do PWM from the Raspberry Pi and it sort of works. I mean, it's, if, depending on how high your demands are for precision, 
uh, it, it sort of works. So, so there are drivers, for example, to drive servos directly from the PWM ports on the Raspberry Pi in Robo4j. So there is this servo abstraction. You can just use it and hook up a servo. And if all you need to have is a micro servo uh, that, that doesn't require that much current, then, then that's all you need. You can just, you know. In a typical application, you wouldn't. But, but, but just to experiment, uh, that's absolutely possible. So, so you just need to be a little bit careful, um, especially with current. Yes? Right, so a good first, uh, so the question was what is a good first project? I think <coughs> that depends on what you want to do, but there are a couple of different ones that, that are sort of, that, that we've built. So if you have a 3D printer, for example, or a friend with a 3D printer, uh, you could do a button presser <laughs> that is wireless, that physically presses a button for you. Um, that is a good one if you want to start with servos doesn't require any special hardware except for a servo uh, and the 3D print, yeah, and some piano wire. But um, yeah, so that's, that's one thing you could do. <clears throat> Another thing that you could do that doesn't require a 3D printer or anything is, is just buy this Adafruit LCD shield. It's an LCD that has a couple of buttons on it. And uh, you just put that on top, it's designed to be able to be put straight on top of the Raspberry Pi. And then you have something with this little LCD screen and buttons. And there is an example that runs uh, on, on Robo4j that um, has a scroller or different demos for doing things with the LCD screen, changing colors, etc. So you just run that and voila, you have something that reacts to button clicks and something that changes colors and, and scrolls text and, uh, you know, and then you can expand upon that to have it networked. Um, there is a REST API, so, so you could start sending things you know, over HTTP to that thing while you have it online in your network. And then you can send little messages to it. And then you, all, of, all of a sudden you have a fun little thing you can set somewhere and just send messages to people or whatever. So yeah, um, uh, that, that, that's also I think like a good start. Then there are other things like um, if you really want to start, and this is where you start burning your Raspberry Pis. <laughs> so if you want to like, um, without having a PWM um, driver, if you just directly start putting um, LEDs or, or button switches uh, directly on the GPIO ports of your, uh, so GPIO is general purpose IO, and there's a whole lot of those ports on Raspberry Pi. Um, we should probably talk a little bit about uh, pragmatic things about hardware uh, to that later. Um, um, but but that's, that's when you really need to be careful because in the low level APIs you can select whether or not internal resistors should be on uh, or off in hardware. And if you think, hey, I know what I'm doing so I'm not going to have any protective little resistor here because I know my shit and it's like, Oops, the program didn't tap, died, damn it, it's dead. So, you, yeah, you need to be really careful there. It's, it's, nowadays I'm always like putting a little extra resistor just to limit the current that could go through if I do wire up things directly to, to the GPIO ports because I know that I'm you know, usually doing this very late when the kids are sleeping and then you get careless. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right, so doing this with little children, is there anything particularly dangerous? dangerous? Um, I, think, I think if you do one of those projects that I mentioned, there really isn't that much dangerous that could go wrong because you don't, you're not giving them cables to connect different pins, right? You're giving them something that is a, here is a little computer with a little screen with little buttons on it. Um, and, and that usually can't go that much wrong. It's when you start giving them wires. That's, that's when things go wrong and start burning. So, so I think, think, think those projects would, would be just fine. Uh, yep. 
<laughs> Are there any building blocks for higher level functions such as controllers or say state machines or things like that? Yeah. If, if I want to build the typical robot, the robot that follows a line yeah. along, the, along the floor. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Right, there are some higher level things, but those are just the ones that we've wanted and we've thought were, were found. So for example, there is a higher level function block for a laser scanner. So if you put a range, laser range finder on top of two servos and you start wanting to scan the room for, for data points, uh, that is present. <laughs> and it's also integrated with the Java flight recorder. So uh, you get per scan, and there is even a visualizer plugin. I haven't ported it to, to JMC7 yet, but uh, for JMC5.5, uh, where you see your scan. Um, so per scan, you can see what it scanned. You see the room and the, uh, you know, the data points that we collected. And there is also buttons for the feature extraction. So uh, you know how we try to find what our walls the corner detection to see what the corners are, and uh, the current uh, sort of uh, finding the next good move kind of deal. So there is in, in, in Drobo4j.math, um, I've put some of that stuff. I'm not sure I've put everything there yet. But there's some. Um, and it's all meant to, to be uh, lightweight enough to be able to run on Raspberry Pi generation two, so it should be fine for, 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 for most purposes. So there is some of that, but not nearly enough. Uh, so so, so there is a lot to be done. That's why I'm talking about this here. <laughs> See if somebody wants to join up, have some fun. Um, so, that's feature extraction. Yeah, right. So the pragmatics about building things, you know, what do you need? How do you do this? Um, well, once you start building some more fun stuff, you probably want at least a solder iron so you can start solder things. There are these lab boards you can buy where you put your things. Um, and there is this fun. <laughs> so for radio controlled stuff, when you connect to them, there is this, uh, these rasters. They are 0.1 inch uh, rasters, lots of, lots of, lots of, lots of pins. And just buy a few strips of those. And if you go to eBay or wherever, you can buy them in the thousands and it costs you a few bucks. It's like really inexpensive. So just go buy those. And then there is something called DuPont connectors. This you want to remember because buying DuPont connectors in a crimp um, uh, tool is actually uh, makes life so much easier and cheaper because you start creating your own cables to the exact length and specification that you want. And those are also like in the hundreds for, for a few bucks. Um, so, so just go out there and buy them from China or wherever you know, um, and buy a little crimp tool. Because then you start making cables it's just and then you're done and you have exactly what you need. So, so DuPont connectors, very good thing. Cream tool, very good thing. Rasters, very good thing. Then you can build, and, and th those are in different sizes as well. So, you know, three, uh, three pole ones are, are the most common for servos, um, but, 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 you know, you might want other sizes. Typically, 4P for, for, for um, the I2C protocol. Then you need four wires. You need ground and the voltage and the, the SDC and SCL, the clock and the data channels. So you need four. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a really good thing to have. Then if you really start building like larger things and you need to s like see signal uh, quality on your different protocols and want to be able to decode them and etc. Then, then you need oscilloscope, but that's like way in the future. You don't need that for a very long time. Um, uh, you can do a lot without having one. But it's a very nice thing to have and they are have getting, getting 
really inexpensive lately also, so a oscilloscope doesn't need to put you back thousands of dollars anymore. It's, it's, it's actually quite quite reasonable price these days. So I feel, yeah, any questions? What is the biggest project you've built with Robo4j? Okay. So what is the biggest project we've built with Robo4j? So I'd have to say that that is Coffee. It's a, um, uh, an autonomous um, little robot that is 3D printed and built from off-the-shelf components um, that uh, can... We, I have a um, video from two years ago where Coffee is running around in the show floor of Java 1. Um, uh, no, I don't have my backpack. I can show you the demo, uh, or I can show you where when he's running around, you know, uh, tr trying to find his way, uh, finding a good place to go, uh, s <laughs> going slower when it's kind of scary, and then he goes like almost to a full stop and he realizes, so there is no way, but just, I'm just, I'm, no. <laughs> Um, so, so, so that is, uh, but that requires you to have a laser range finder, <clears throat> and those are, I mean, don't start with the laser range finder because it, it's a pretty expensive component, and if you wire it up wrong, uh, it's like, yeah, <laughs> so, 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 um, uh, take that project later, <laughs> and and the laser range finder is actually not as expensive as you would think. There is um, some. Uh, uh, what are they called? The light... Um, Garmin actually bought them. LiDAR Light, uh, it's called. Uh, and Garmin now owns that. Uh, and they <laughs> increased the prices slightly. But um, uh, they are about 100 bucks uh, for the laser rangefinder, which is really inexpensive. But you don't have any control, right? So you can't really... You need to put it on some servos or build your own little contraption to, to, to actually start sampling. There are some that has basically taken lighter light and then put it on a <laughs> on a rotating motor stepper <laughs> so that you can can, can scan in 360. Uh, I just scan 90 because that's typically what you get from a normal servo. But <clears throat> so 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 there are more expensive solutions to be bought, but that are still reasonable if you want to do laser range finding and scanning. But but um, yeah, uh, wait a little bit with that. Um, I think do 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 some simple things where you learn how to do the I to C uh, wiring properly. <laughs> Work with the crimp tool, <laughs> build your cables, uh, learn how to 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 neatly build every everything, and then 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 go for the laser range finder. So I think that is uh, the most, but. Pretty much when my toddlers were born, uh, I didn't have time. So I haven't, like, for two and a half years, I haven't really had time to put anything more interesting in there, um, which is also why I'm here talking today. <laughs> See if somebody wants to join. Um, yeah. What's the best way to take your Raspberry Pi mobile? So what's the best way to take your Raspberry Pi Mobile? So the best way to take your Raspberry Pi Mobile is to buy a motor controller um, that can be controlled. Um, okay, so easiest or best? Okay, both. <laughs> easiest is probably also to buy a motor controller but that has uh, like RC inputs. Then you can take your, your PWM module that you control over I2C, then hook it up to the motor controller and just say, you know, now I want the motor to go as fast as it can. Now I want it to go backwards. Now I want it to. So that's one of the easiest, easiest way, I think. And then you have the servo abstraction in, in, in Robo4j for controlling that. Uh, the best way. Oh, there are so many ways. I wouldn't say that any of them are best. They're good for different things. But So another way is to make sure that they have um, quadrature encoders on the motors. Uh, so there is uh, this thing that will count 
the, how much um, the, the axis has rotated. So if you want to know how far the motor has gone, then you can use the quadrature encoder. And there are some motor controllers that are really nice because you can very specifically say that I want you to go forward now. I want to go indirectly. I want you to go forward with this many rotations per minute on this wheel, uh, which makes it kind of easy to control. So I built a, and you can use this for fun too. I mean, I, I, this all is for fun, but, but uh, you, you can build radio controlled little vehicles. So I built quickly 3D printed and built a little robot for, for, for my kids um, that they can control through normal radio controller. So all you need is a motor controller. And if you have quadrature encoders, damn, do they steer straight. I mean, it's like they go like <laughs> straight as an arrow <laughs> and then they turn. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's cool. So, so I, I'd go for a motor controller that is dedicated and quadrature encoder uh, engines. And if you want to buy engines, I might suggest uh, Polulu is an American company, I think, where you can buy uh, metal geared uh, quadrature encoder engines that are really easy to work with. How do you get rid of the wire? Are they good battery packs or? Oh, uh, right, the, the electricity. How, how do you get electricity to them? Right, so since I am an RC nerd, um, I fly a lot of different things like helicopters and planes and, and uh, drones there. There are now, um, I, I always have a lot of battery packs lying around. But I would suggest standard RC LiPo batteries. That's the easiest thing. And then you just need uh, either the motor controller itself will have a, a voltage converter so that you can t just take a LiPo pack, put it in, and then you have somewhere you can get five volts out of it to drive your, your, your Raspberry Pi. And the easiest way, if you're not really good at soldering, the easiest way to get the electricity to drive your Raspberry Pi is to just cut one of those uh, USB cables and then figure out what's what and then use that cut cable because um, soldering, you need to have a re really fine tip and some really steady hands to, to solder these uh, micro USB uh, connectors yourself. So it's usually just easier to take one of the micro USB cable and, and then done with it. I did some recent experiments and that I learned that USB cables using losing a lot of voltage. So if you have like a one meter USB cable, you can lose like, yeah. depending on the make, um, uh, one volt of, uh, is there any recommendation for good USB? Um, Soldering yourself or? with better cables or um, just, they are usually very short. Make it as short as possible. Yeah, make the shortest possible cable. Because you, um, to be fair, the robots are usually fairly small. So, you know, you have the battery cable, then you usually have nice and fat wires. Um, don't even need to be fat, but, but so that you don't burn them depending on what kind of battery packs you use. And, and, and then you have your, I have um, voltage um, uh, converters, dedicated ones. Uh, they are also really cheap and you can buy them at, at um, Pululu as well. Um, so step down converters and then then uh, the last remaining little cable to the Raspberry Pi is usually extremely short. I also learned that the Raspberry Pi itself is really sensitive to the input voltage so if it drops like below 4.9 or something it will go yeah. off. Do you have any recommendation how to get a, a stabilized mobile power source? Spend money on a good converter that's worth the money. So, 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 um, yeah, do spend money. What do you mean by and converter? Also a chip? What do you, just a chip? Or what, what do you mean by converter? So you can buy these breakout boards um, on Polulu that are step-down converters with very good specifications. They keep, you know, the voltage very well. And you buy those and you spend the money and you don't look back. <laughs> and you use the converter to power the Raspberry? Yes. So the battery is connected to a lot of different things. One of them is the converter. One of them is also, if you want to drive servos, servos can, uh, um, 
the current draw of a servo can be very uneven. So, um, so you typically want to have a, a, um, uh, a BEC for that too. You want, also want to have, have a separate com uh, voltage converter for your servos. Now we're getting into details. This is not the first project. I mean, if you, if you have gotten this far, yes, th th then you need to start looking at it. And I, you know, if you have any questions whatsoever about how I solve these problems, you know, just drop me an email. I'd be happy to answer. Um, but high quality, high grade uh, voltage converters are, are, are uh, worth the money. And buy a bunch of them. Just have them sitting in your uh, drawer somewhere <laughs> so you can pull out one out whenever you need one. Okay, thanks. Do you have any recommendations for this, for this make or whatever? Is yeah, Polunas ones have worked really well for me. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I can f look at what exactly I bought and I can send you a link. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry? Postal. Postal, okay, I, I'll try to find out where. Yeah, so, so high grade voltage converters are good. Um, uh, depending on how crazy a, a, a machine you want a mobile machine you want to build you there is also uh, just engine selection is, is, is hard you need to uh, really calculate your needs uh, depending on your wheel size and your you know what 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 kind of uh, torque you eventually want on your machine um, so it can be really hard to get the first one right. Um, I got it almost right. I ended up wanting it slightly faster. Uh, I got too much, much torque. But, but um, so, so when you're selecting these gearboxes, um, you're buy, buying these um, uh, encoder engines, uh, you need to think carefully about what uh, gearbox you want for them and also what operating vol voltage you want. I have ended up going with, so not that you should still think about this, but if you want an easy starting point, uh, the high powered engines, the 12 volt high powered engines um, with uh, a 1 to 34 gear ratio is usually a good mix and balance for, for my robots for, for, for power and speed. Your mileage might vary. <laughs> Enough. Yeah, uh, very quickly because we've got two minutes. Um, oh. Is there a way to TDD robots? Sorry. Is there a way to test driven develop robots? Test driven. Well, I am test driving them. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, that's part of the fun with robots. If you have them running around interacting with physical reality and the, your program is wrong, Boy, do you see that. <laughs> Schmack. Uh, so, so uh, test driven. It's so chaotic, you know, the world. There is a way. So one thing that I did, for example, and I think I would probably expand upon this when I'm starting to do more advanced algorithms for, for, um, um, for uh, continuous mapping of the environment. Um, but but uh, actually, uh, the way I developed the first algorithms for, for, for uh, and started verifying that my implementation was sound for feature extraction, etc., was that I let the robot run around with a very simple program, just capturing uh, points, so scans. And after that, I was sitting comfortably in the sofa with my laptop and the scans, just trying out ideas and then rendering them in mission control. So just drawing the lines that it's found for the feature extraction on top of the um, dots, <laughs> the sampled points. So then I could, could um, then I didn't need to run anymore. I had real values from, from, from well, my apartment might not be the, like, the world, but it's at least a representative part of some world. And then I could start, start seeing if that, that worked. So that's one thing you can do. Um, and then if you find something that is bad, you can take those points, you know, just the hard data, 
and you can have a test for it. There is a test for it, for something where my algorithm uh, breaks down. It's uncommented because I haven't had time to solve it yet. <laughs> so, so, so that's one way you can do unit testing. You can have real world data and then put uh, unit tests around them to see that you actually find what you're supposed to find. Do you have any continuous deployment process uh, <laughs> or some, how do you deploy it? I mean, do you like pull out the SD card every time or do you have like some, some automated setup there, to do incremental development? Uh, we, we have testing actually. There is integration testing done on GitHub with us, the, what are they called? The, whatever. So, so we have some tests, they are run. It's usually for the math parts, um, just making sure that nobody messes up with that. Um, and then uh, there is, for some framework parts, there are also unit tests. But again, there are some things that are really chaotic, um, where, where you really need real world data, because you know, there will be uh, uh, systematic and non-systematic errors in, in the data that you get. And no, I was not talking about testing the library, I was actually asking about continuous um, integration d d no, actually deployment so if you have like a real project like the robot and you do like incremental development okay mm -hmm. i need to improve the algorithm the sensors whatever um so how do you how yeah how to push it to the raspberry without uh, let's say oh. out the sd card or connecting it physically every time so nah. <laughs> no we just git pull and then we run <laughs> Okay, thank you. Wrapping this up. Um, right, so key takeaways. It's not hard. It's, it's not scary. It's, it's, it's really fun. And, and uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to, to try this out because, it, well, it really is fun. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>